Now, Fiona and I both tested negative this morning, so I can speak to you with some confidence. And um, Fiona's going to do the middle section of this. She's going to do the meat of this message, actually. And I essentially have a long, depressing introduction to do before we get to the good bit. And the reason is this. You know, for most of the last 18 months, and when we did all 40 days of waiting and all the rest of it, we've been thinking about how do we cope during COVID. And now we're starting as the numbers perhaps are stabilizing. I mean, who even knows now? But the way things are looking, we're in a position to start thinking about how to recover after COVID. It's a shift in the way that we think. But even that, you know, we're, we're doing so cautiously because not everybody's properly vaccinated. I know we've got people here who've been vaccinated once. Um, uh, we've got kids who aren't vaccinated at all. We've got, also, we, we all know what the issues are, right? that we can't, in the way we'd like to, just fling ourselves into, hooray, here we are all back together and all running around and hugging and singing loudly and squeezed in and you know all that stuff we're, that, that we're not doing. So here we are back in the church building. Um, but do, what it makes me think about, this isn't in my notes, but do you remember uh, after um, Haggai and his buddies rebuilt the temple, uh, the elders who were there before, they come back and look at it and say, uh, the glory of the latter house is less than the glory of the earlier house. So what they're saying is, yeah, we rebuilt the temple, but it doesn't quite feel right. It doesn't feel like it used to. And that's sort of what this is like, isn't it? We're, we're glad to be back together. We're glad to be in the building. But on the other hand, we know it isn't quite where we want it to be. Tim, aren't you glad you asked me to do this message? <laughs> So here's the thing. Uh, there is a, a restoration available to us. And, and Fiona and I are really pleased that this year, 40 days, is going to be 40 days of restoration as we try and think about what God will work in us to restore what's been missing. Uh, the prophet Joel talks about a great swarm of locusts, an appalling natural disaster, um, just smashing people's lives apart in uh, Israel um, hundreds of years before Christ. Um, and we can look at that and say, actually, we have our own huge natural disaster that's coming in and, and affecting our lives now. But what Joel also says in chapter 2 of his book, in verse 25, the Lord says, I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locusts. Or in older translations, it says, I will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Uh, John, can you please turn down the microphone on Joshi there? <laughs> so there is a promise of restoration. There's a promise from God that, that what we've lost, uh, he can give back. And what I want to look at today, well, what Fiona and I together we're going to look at, is what the process is, what we go through to get there. And the reason I said my part of this is depressing is because the first point that we want to make is this, that healing requires honesty. So I'm going to ask us in the next few minutes to be honest with ourselves about where we are now. And the reason that's so important is uh, imagine someone with a physical injury. Like the classic thing would be, it'll be a man who doesn't want to go to the doctor because it's too tough to need that. And it turns out that what's actually happened is he's broken his femur or something. Uh, but he doesn't go because he thinks, oh, it's just a scratch. You know, it's only a flesh wound. It'll get better on its own. But unless you admit to yourself what is wrong with you, you cannot get help. And the same thing is true, of course, with mental health problems. People who are not merely sad, but suffering from depression, an actual medical condition of depression, who need to get help, won't get that unless they're able to admit to themselves the situation they're in. And the same is true of our emotional conditions. And the sheer, this is different from depression, but the simple sadness of what the last 18 months have been like so if we're going to be healed, we need to start by acknowledging what's happened to us and what we're feeling, being honest with ourselves and with God and with each other about those things. Now, some people have got no problem doing that. They were hit hard from the beginning. They've, they've realized it. They know the truth of it. Other people, Fiona and I are in this category, initially, when we started being locked down and Kept away from other people. We were pretty cool with it, to be honest, to start with. And it's only over a period of time 
the, the kind of novelty of a, a month just our family on our own stretched out into 18 months of, oh, just my family. Uh, you know, 24-7, same people all the time. So that's built up on us. And I even know some people who even now are saying, oh, yeah, I'm enjoying it. I like, I like being locked down. I like the isolation. I don't really know if I believe those people anymore, you know. Again, for a month, yeah. But for 18 months, no. So what I want to do for the next few minutes is consider some of the things that we've lost in those 18 months and just look them square in the face and in a sense feel, not wallow in, but in a healthy way feel what we've lost. Now a lot of these things are not specific to the church. A lot of these things everybody has lost across this country, across the world. So here are some of them. Most fundamentally, We've lost people, people who have died, friends and family. Uh, Also, people who during this time have died of non-COVID causes, but we couldn't go to the funerals or we couldn't say goodbye. That hurts. Here's another thing. Uh, Family ties have been weakened. Grandparents have not been able to visit the grandchildren and so on. And all of us have missed seeing each other's children growing up. You know, one of the things probably a lot of you felt coming in last week, or this week if this is your first week, is just looking at the kids and saying, oh, gosh, I hardly recognize this person or that person. Uh, Like it's come as a big surprise to us that they're 18 months older than they were. And, uh, of course, it's not just adults that miss seeing the kids. More importantly, kids have missed seeing each other, missed a year of school, most of them. Not just the education, but the socialization the experience of being together. There's more. Think about the world of work. Some people have lost their jobs. Most people have lost uh, at least some part of of what they're able to do for work. Some people possibly even have had businesses have had to close down. And for all, almost all of us, uh, even people whose jobs have been relatively unaffected, we've lost the sense of connection with our peer group at work, the people we work with that we're not seeing. When I think about sort of what defines my day-to-day existence, it's really three uh, groups of relationships. One of them is with my family. Uh, One is with the people I know from work. And one is with the people I know from church. Now, two of those have been pretty much knocked out for 18 months. I mean, yes, we have Zoom. Hands up if you love Zoom. No, no one's hands are up. I mean, it, it's miraculous, but who needs it? Right? It's not the same. We know it's not the same. And so it took a while, I think, for me to, to kind of grasp this for myself and realize how much I'd lost. And I wonder if some of us as well, have, because it's crept up on us so slowly, this gradual distancing from people that we know and love, And that, of course, affects mental health. A lot of people now uh, don't have the same stability of mental health they had before. Also, straight up mental ability. Now, I've found for myself, um, my job, I'm a computer programmer, my job is all about thinking hard. I've been really not very good at it at all for the last couple of months. I just can't concentrate like I'm supposed to, like my job requires. I wonder how many other people are feeling that. What else? Um, When we have had recently some kind of social events, we've had um, some people come around to a film night out on our patio and behind the house with our boys, sort of uh, early 20s. Our boys have both found they kind of lost the knack of socialising. Anyone else have that experience? So when you do get together with people, you think, oh, it's brilliant, I haven't seen this person for ages. And then... Now, how does this go again? Would we? Uh, and Matthew also pointed out he'd lost stamina for socialising. So there were people he was really pleased to see again. But after half an hour of talking, he was exhausted. Do you know, it's reassuring to me to see all the nodding heads around here. It's not just my family that, that's going through all this. So we're, what's happened is, in 18 months, we've really changed. We're not the same people we were. Physical contact is an obvious one. You know, my mum uh, lives alone. 
And for months and months and months, she didn't physically touch another human being. And uh, this is going to seem frivolous, but just fun. You know, I, I like going to restaurants. Uh, we very rarely go to the theatre, but I like the idea that we could if we wanted to. You know, that's, these things are gone. Uh, we've hosted a couple of parties out in the back garden, but the, even there, you know, they're kind of careful parties. So at various stages in the last 18 months, I think most of us, maybe all of us, have had moments of feeling very alone, very broken-hearted. We've lost a lot of our sense of belonging. So in our heads, if we've been members of this church for a while, in our heads we know that we're still members, that we're still connected. But in our hearts, I think probably we don't feel the truth of that the way that we have done in the past. Do you know, Fiona won't necessarily thank me for giving this example, but there have been times in the last 18 months where we've felt... You know, in the past, we've been involved with the leadership of this church. At the moment, we're not really. And, and there are times when Fiona particularly has felt as though she's been kind of pushed out of that. Now, that's not true at all, of course. Again, in our heads, we know that's not true. But the heart says something different, doesn't it? When you're away from people that you're used to spending time with, it's really tough. So the question I want to ask is have we shut down? Because that's a, a natural defensive response. When things get difficult, to shut down. It's like someone who has an unhappy love affair and says, well, I'm never going to fall in love again. You know, we can all do that to different degrees with different things. And I feel as though there's part of me now, with all the other problems we've got with socialising, that all, almost, on the subconscious level, understand me, it's not that I dislike you all but there's part of me that almost feels like well I almost don't want to get back into spending time socially with people because then what if it gets ripped away again yeah so these are things that I think everybody across the country maybe the world has lost but then beyond that there are things that we in the church particularly have lost and again I, I'm, in a way, I'm sorry to, to kind of hammer this home, but I, I think it's important that we just recognize the truth of it. Now, in some areas, I think the church has done pretty well in the last 18 months. You know, we've still been teaching from the Bible. Uh, evangelistically, we seem to be doing okay. Uh, but there are two areas where we've really lost out. One of them is fellowship. And uh, I think it's notable that much, much more of the New Testament is written to groups of people than it is to individuals. So some of Paul's letters are written to individuals. He writes to Timothy, he writes to Titus. But most of the while he's writing to a church, the church in Galatia, the church in Corinth, and so they go as you read all the way through. Uh, and yet, we've largely been functioning as individual Christians for 18 months. Not entirely, of course, and in the church, we've done the best we can to try and keep people connected and provide ways for people to be in touch. But we all know it's no substitute for the real thing. So we've missed out on a lot of the growth that God would usually intend for us. There are 59 places in the New Testament where we're told a way to behave towards one another. 59 verses that say, love one another, or encourage one another, or rebuke each other in love or sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. And it goes on and on, 59 of them. Obviously, lots of repeats. Lots of them say love one another. But 59 times in 27 books, we're told this is how you, Christians, should behave towards one another. And we haven't been able to do a lot of those things. So, yes, each of us individually is connected with God our Father. But it's also true that the way the New Testament envisages us growing is not just by direct connection to God, but also through the time we spend with each other, the way we build each other up, the way when one of us falls, the others lift that person, the way when somebody is starting to explore a new uh, gift or a new area of serving, people can encourage them and redirect them and help them to see uh, what they could be doing differently. All these things, it's all gone. 
And then the other area where the church has really suffered, uh, I think, is worship. You know, um, it's been very hard. It's basically been impossible to have COVID-safe experiences of live worship. Uh, And yet Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, where two or three gather in my name, I am there among them. Now there is, of course, again, there is a sense in which God is always with us. But there is also a sense in which God is particularly with the gathered body, gathered body of believers. And we've missed on that. And when we're doing worship just by singing along with videos from YouTube, again, you know, it's good to have these fallback things. Just like it's better to have Zoom than not to be in touch at all. But the substitute, again, is not really a substitute. You know, you can't respond, or I can't, to a worship video on YouTube. And um, we've found as well, even over these 18 months, even the physical ability to sing and to breathe deeply and to project the voice, even that... You know, it's just faded away. People can't sing very well now. Uh, And of course, all the gifts that we're told in the New Testament to encourage each other with in worship, uh, and things like in the hour of worship that we used to do on the Sunday evenings occasionally, which are very interactive. Uh, We've lost all of that. So, the image I want to leave you with before I hand over to Fiona, and Fiona has the good news part of this message. (laughs) Uh, Probably a lot of you will have heard the metaphor of a church being like a fire with lots of coals in it, and the danger that if you take one coal out of the fire, it doesn't take long before it cools down. So as all the Christians together, in keeping each other hot, one taken out of there cools down quickly. And conversely, if you take a cold coal and put it in an existing fire, it doesn't take long for it to heat up. But at the moment, and for most of the last 18 months, What we've been like is a fire with lots of coals in, and each coal has been taken out of the fire. So they're all, if you like, just kind of sitting on the, what do you call that kind of flat area in front of a fireplace? Hearth, that's it, thank you. Yeah, so if every coal in the fire is separated from all the others and is cooling down, is it even a fire anymore? That's another extremely good point. So, the, having laid out this bleak landscape, and, and please forgive me for having, you know, I'm the bad cop in this sermon, Fiona's the good cop. How can we find healing in the situation? What's the answer? How do we come out of this and back into something resembling real life? Uh, and the healing, I'm not going to do the punchline. Fiona, come and tell us. Good morning, hello. Um, it wasn't that depressing. I, I know it was a long list. I wasn't expecting to, to say any of this. But um, when Mike gave that list, actually there was, a, there was a nodding and there was a sense of community and there was a sense of, oh yeah, we did go through that. And yes, I can relate to that one. So there was a sort of starting of honesty. There was a sense of, yeah, that one was me or that one. Even this morning, talking to people, I've met two primary school teachers who are absolutely exhausted. What, what they've been through, there's a doctor here this morning I met, she's exhausted. What they've been through, but to be able to share it and to say it out loud, I think the healing process has started just by being able to say things out loud and say, yeah, that one was me. So the honesty is there, the healing process has started, and it's true, I do get the good news. I do get to uh, come along and say, here's the hope, here's the restoration, and it comes through finding healing in Jesus. So yeah, I get the good bit, thank you for that. So I'm gonna begin with a story. A few years ago, I had a friend, not in this church, and uh, she was very academic. She, she wanted to do a study of the, Old Test- no, the New Testament gospel examples of every single time Jesus healed anyone. So she looked at every recorded instance and she asked herself some questions like, um, is the person being brought to Jesus? What does Jesus say? How does he react? What sort of miracle does he do? What sort of the, what's the context? And she did loads of them. She studied every single one. And this is, she was looking for a pattern to know what she could do. And this is the conclusion she came to. No pattern, no formula. There simply is no pattern or formula that Jesus sticks to when he heals someone. So what I'm, I'm starting to say is for every person in this room, your process, your hurts, your pains, your challenges, they're all going to be uniquely individual and different. And Jesus met each person 
in an individual case by case, person by person. So this is going to be a very personal process. And uh, just as some examples of how different all the healings in the Bible are, I've got a list of some of them. Sometimes Jesus just spoke the words and they were healed. Sometimes uh, he wasn't even present uh, and the person was healed. So there was a Roman centurion who went up to Jesus and said, um, please heal my servant. And that servant was back in a different house. And, and at that moment, the, the servant was healed. Sometimes Jesus actually needed to say, your sins are forgiven first before he healed them. Sometimes that comes into it. Sometimes the healings were just plain bizarre. I mean, there was a blind man and Jesus spat on the ground, mixed in the dirt with his fingers and wiped it on, on the guy's eyes and he was healed. So, um, and sometimes people had to do things. Uh, sometimes they had to, like the, the 10 lepers who were sent to go and present themselves to the priests, the high priests, and not the priests, and, uh, and on the way, as they walked along, they got healed. So lots of different ways and absolutely no formula. Jesus restored people as individuals. He also restored groups of people, like his disciples, as, as a unique group. But he also restored whole nations. And, and we're going to be looking at, um, in 40 days of restoration, we're actually going to look a little bit about the, the, um, the nation of Israel and how God restored them and uh, he brought them healing. So, over, so we, yeah, what we're going to be doing in, in the next few weeks and across 40 days is just offering opportunities for people to come and find healing in their situation. And it might be as individuals, as groups, and maybe as, as a church, and maybe even as a nation. And uh, so what I wanted to do was to whet our appetites for that by bringing uh, a set of verses. And I did not know that Lizzie and Avi's song this morning, which was gorgeous, thank you, it's very, very moving, um, was going to finish off with those two verse, the three verses um, from Matthew 11, 28 um, to 29, 30. And um, the verses are these, because these are the very ones that I chose as my main example of how does Jesus heal us. And this, this is an example, a taster. I'm going to read Matthew 11, 28 to 29. Then Jesus said... Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And it goes on with, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm just going to pick these verses apart. It was lovely to see those verses come off already during, the, during that video. I'm going to pick the pieces apart and just see what that might actually look like for some people here, maybe, to how we can come to Jesus for healing. Firstly, we come to Jesus. He says, come to me. Well, what might that look like? I'm sorry for, if this is sounding basic, but I'm just going to suggest what, what might that look like to come to Jesus. Maybe we go for a long walk on our own, and during that long walk, we might just suddenly say, wow. Things are hard. This is really tough. Please help, Lord Jesus. That would be coming to Jesus. That's an example. Or maybe we're with some Christian friends and they offer to pray for us and we just say, yes. And or maybe um, during some worship, we just allow ourselves to stop and let those defenses down and say, do you know, this is how I'm feeling, Lord. I'm going to be re absolutely real with you right now. He can handle it. He can take anything. <laughs> Maybe we wake up in the middle of the night and we want to cry about something. Cry, then bring the hurt and the weariness to him there. But the point is that we can take an active decision to come to Jesus. And it's not hard. He's there. And he invites us. So after come to me, what comes next? Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Well, we've actually been hearing some of those heavy burdens already this morning. Maybe you identified with some of those that Mike read out from his list. And uh, these are some of the challenges and burdens that people have been facing during COVID. So we come to Jesus with those burdens. What do we expect to find? What sort of reception are we going to get when we come to Jesus, Lord and Saviour, Lord of the universe, with weariness, sadness and burdens? Is he going to say, come on, buck up? Pull yourself together, onwards and upwards, try a bit harder, off you go. No, no, really no. We're approaching a real person. He's a person who understands. 
He knows how we feel. He knows that we feel weariness and can feel burdened. And how does he know that? Because he himself lived as a human. The Gospels give us many glimpses of Jesus' humanity. And when we see the stories of what Jesus himself experienced. And so I'm going to give some examples. Jesus knew what it was like to feel really tired. So he's sitting there at the well, the woman at the well, the Samaritan. Uh, he goes up to her, he asks for a drink, he's thirsty. And we're also told he was tired. Jesus knows what tiredness is like. Jesus knows what hunger is like. Now, I don't know about anyone else here, but if I get hungry, I'm really grumpy. Yep, Mike, no. You are. Mike's actually shaking his head. That's just being very kind. Um, <laughs> I need feeding. But when Jesus, Jesus fasted for 40 days, he knew hunger. Jesus wept. He went to um, the tomb of his friend Lazarus. He saw his friends, personal deep friends, grieving, and he wept with them. And in fact, Hebrews 4 verse 15, I'm going to read it out. It says this about Jesus. This high priest of ours, that's Jesus, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all all of the same testings that you do, yet he did not sin. So he knows and he understands that we feel these things. He knows when we're depleted, lonely, and discouraged. And in fact, this verse from Hebrews goes on to say, to encourage us because of these things, because he understands us, therefore take confidence, be bold in approaching the throne. Come in your time of need. Come and, come and get what you need. Comes right on the back of him saying, Jesus understands, he, he gets it. He gets us humans. We don't have to stand there and try and muster up some kind of strong Christian impression. Be real, be yourself. That's where the healing comes. Absolute honesty, be real. So what comes after that? Jesus says, I will give you rest. So for the weary and the burdened this morning, Jesus knows what, exactly what we need. He says, you need rest and I'm going to give it to you. So how, do, how does rest from the burdens come? Again, another sort of practical thing. Well, what, what do we do? We're going to sit there and rest just magically arrives on us? What's, what's going on there? Um, well, in the next verse, let's carry on looking at this uh, passage. It says, Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So what's going on there? Here, he offers to give us a, a different burden, an easy one, one that's easy and light, not a heavy one. And he also shows us a better way to live. He says, learn from me, because uh, this is a better way to live. So we've got, we've got some learning to do. We need to gaze at Jesus and say, okay, how can, you, how can I learn from you? What, what are you like? What's going on there? And at that point, Jesus reveals his heart. He says, what am I like? Look at what I'm like. And he says, I'm gentle and humble. So that's what we find when we come to Jesus, feeling really weary and burdened. We find somebody who is gentle and humble and wants to give us rest and wants us to take us by the hand and lead us on and heal us and restore us. Not someone who's proud or, or rejecting us or self-serving. Not somebody who looks at us and just thinks, oh, you, you know, try a bit harder, you could, you could be doing more there. No, he gets it. He gets it and he absolutely understands. He won't abandon us. He won't forsake us. He is gentle and humble. I mean, let's just stop that. That's staggering. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Son of God. We're talking about the one who was there at the beginning of the universe. He could just snap his fingers and we're all, we're all done. He could. He could. And he doesn't. He chooses. He says, come to me, you who are weary. I'm gentle. I'm humble. I'm here for you. I want to give you rest. So in those two verses, we get the most extraordinary glimpse of, of what's going on in a healing process. And you will find rest for your souls. There it is, the healing that we need so much. Rest from what? Rest from, maybe it's different for every person here, rest from actual tiredness, rest from physical exhaustion. But maybe for some, it's rest from striving to achieve. Maybe for some, it's rest from striving to win approval. Rest from striving to feel loved. Rest from striving to feel peace during uncertainty. These are all hard things, and they take up a lot of energy. Jesus wants to give us rest. So in the space of these two verses, this route to healing is mapped out. And it might be that this is the way forward for some of you this morning, if you're feeling low and depleted and burdened. And here's how it goes. We come to him with our weariness and burdens, acknowledging it to him, knowing that he understands us, 
and gives us rest. And he does this by showing us a better way to live, which we need to learn from. And then he reveals his heart, which is gentle and humble. And then he gives us the rest that we so desperately need um, when we're weary and burdened. So that was a taster. That was two verses. That was one way through, maybe for some of you here, for exhaustion. There are other verses which really reinforce the message that God wants to love, heal, and restore us. Really need to hear that this morning. God really wants to do this. He, he's, he's like the doctor sitting there in the surgery saying, come on, come on, come to my surgery. I, I want to heal you. I can make you better. I can do this. Psalm 103, verses 4 and 5. He redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. I've often thought of the pit as being a little bit like despair and depression. He redeems your life from the pit, crowns you with love and compassion. He satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I'm just going to say that again. He satisfies your desires with good things. So you get... Whatever your desires are, you get those satisfied with good things. Whatever my desires are, I, I get those satisfied with a different set of things because each one of us comes to him as an individual. There's no mold here. There's no formula. We don't have to sort of all try and look the same. Thank heavens we don't, you know. <laughs> but we, we come as individuals. What your set of needs are this morning, you bring those to Jesus and you'll get your needs satisfied with good things and your youth renewed like the eagles that's all about kind of people who are exhausted who wants to be soaring up like eagles like a youth youthful person we've lived with youthful person people for 18 months and you know they've got a lot of energy so um as a far okay this is a hun- psalm 103 verse 13 as a father has compassion on his children so the lord has compassion on those who fear him we come to someone who is compassionate and finally Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Just a few taster verses, maybe, maybe those are going to appeal to some of the people who are here this morning. So maybe you're wondering why, as we reset church and things start up, we're spending a bit of time focusing all these negative hurts and losses, because surely things are really moving well for this church. We've got new blended church. I'm, I'm loving the cameras this morning. It's like, ooh, don't know which one to look at. Okay, cameras. Um, and, and there's a real strong presence online. We've given people coming to church, maybe for the first time this morning, because they've only seen us online, because they saw Tim Time. Tim Time was great. Loads of people have loved Tim Time. Do, do more. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we're appreciating each other more. We're appreciating nature more. So shouldn't we just be looking forward? And I'm going to say no. I I think we need to stop and just reflect because um, I found myself thinking about wounds. Now, wounds can go one of two ways, possibly. Please don't correct me, the doctor who's here. Um, They can get, um, they can heal. They can heal healthily and we get better. Um, But actually, and that's that's the best outcome, but actually if they they get infected and they might get um, toxic, they might get... Uh, poisonous, they they might fail to heal, and then we get worse, and then we might die. And I feel this is a picture of um, maybe of our healing process emotionally and spiritually, that we've got to be really careful about how we heal, that we do bring it to Jesus, because Hebrews 12, 15 carries this warning, watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So in this warning, if, if our wounds aren't brought to Jesus, if we've been hurt, and we don't bring them to be healed properly, we may have roots of bitterness that grow up and can can continue to grow and actually harm us more and and the church. So if someone who's been hurt, it might be that you need to forgive someone. I know several people with long COVID, and one of them knows who brought it into their household and what reckless behavior they did to do that. And now they're fine, and he's got very bad long COVID. Uh, He said to me, I've forgiven them. Wow. But forgiveness might need to happen in situations where we've been hurt. Um, And uh, if we don't forgive, it might mean that this emotional, spiritual wound may linger and fester and bitterness will be like a poisonous root that grows and can prevent the healing taking place. So we also know that a wound, when it's healed, can leave a scar. Um, I I just want to point out a scar is not a wound, it's it's a healed wound. So it no longer has any power over us. So many of us are emerging from this pandemic maybe with scars and wounds, um, but that's not the same as walking around um, with uh, an open, open wound. So the scars are not the same as a, an open wound, it's a healed wound. So those of us with wounds, I'd like to encourage you to just bring them to Jesus. 
He longs to heal us, rest, uh, give us rest from our burdens, and give us un he understands what we've been through. He's gentle and humble, and he offers rest and healing, restoration for those who come to him. Uh, maybe we've got scars, but that's okay, because we've come through and we've been healed. And before I hand back to Mike, I just want to read out the words of one of the songs, which, thank you, Rosie, we are going to do uh, at the end of this sermon. We're going to sing Never Once by Matt Redman. And uh, the words that caught me in particular were these. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone, never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Didn't think that was going to catch me, but it did. So I'll hand back to Mike and really enjoy, hope you enjoy singing that last song. Thanks. Uh, what we would love to do now is just say, um, all right, come up and we'll pray with you and then you'll be healed and everything will be all right. Um, so we're not going to do that. When a land has been without rain for a long time and the ground is parched and it cracks, when rain falls, it doesn't soak into the ground. It just rolls off the surface. In a smaller level, uh, we see that with the very badly cared for pot plants we have in our house. You know, when the little plug of earth dries out, and the, oh, that needs watering, I pour water on it, it just kind of falls off and goes down the sides. It takes repeated rainfall before rain can heal a parched land. It takes repeated waterings before my poor basil plant, well, I was going to say recover, but I've never had one recover. But okay, ignore that metaphor. <laughs> it takes time. And that's, you know, point one of this was healing requires honesty. Point two, which Fiona brought, is that healing comes from Jesus. Point three is this healing takes time. By the way, uh, do you remember a few weeks ago we had a, a poem that Kate had written and recited, which was talking about an underground river? And the reason that's so encouraging to me is because that's not just water falling on the land and flowing off it. It's water deep inside. It's water already there. It's present within us. And that's the reality, of course. That's what is happening with uh, God working in us moment by moment, day by day. But again, it still takes time. It takes time to put it together. I want to touch briefly on a, a slightly discredited idea. It's the five stages of grief. Uh, it's known as the Kubler-Ross model. And it's the idea that as people go through grief, they go through five stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. Now, any psychologist now will tell you it's not that simple. Not everybody does all the stages. They don't do them in the same order. They might do three of them at once. But it's still a useful kind of framework to think about what we need to reckon with as we're trying to recover from difficult times. Uh, and it's interesting that, that all of the first four stages, before you get to acceptance, all of those first four stages have a distinctively Christian response to them, I think. Uh, and those are the things we're going to need to keep coming back to repeatedly as God works in us. So if we think about denial, that often our first reaction if something terrible happens is just to blank it out, pretend it's not happening, deny that it's happening. We talked about that with people who said, oh, I'm enjoying lockdown. Yeah, denying all the ways that it hurts us. And what does that require? Uh, honesty. It needs honesty with ourselves and with other people. Now the second stage is anger. Um, and the thing about that it's a very natural reaction to a lot of these things. That also needs honesty, but it's honesty with God specifically. And if we're feeling anger about any of the effects of COVID and the lockdowns that have come with it, then one of the things we need to do is be honest in expressing that to God. Uh, it's no good our trying to pass it off as no big deal. You know, Fiona talks about the correct Christian response, the CCR we call it in our family. And it can be such a harmful thing because 
what happens is, if, especially if you're brought up as a Christian, you leap straight to the correct Christian response because you know what's expected of you as a Christian. So if Fiona goes through something painful, then, then her kind of immediate reaction is, brush it off, doesn't matter, it's okay, God still loves me, this person's still good. But actually, you often have to acknowledge the anger before you can do that with integrity. Because if you jump straight to the CCR, the anger's still there. You just haven't dealt with it. It's just pushed down. Uh, and that, that's where a wound can turn into an infected wound. So when there's anger, we need to be honest with God in bringing it to God and admitting our own flawed response, recognizing the reality of the anger. It's a complicated thing to work through because often we'll feel, okay, I, I, I'm wrong to be angry about this, but I'm right to be angry about it as well. You know, think about, um, that's one of my favorite silly verses in the Bible is right at the end of the story of Jonah and his... It's, <laughs> After the city of Nineveh has been saved through Jonah's prophecy, and Jonah's really grumpy about it, he's right Mardi, and he sits down by the wall, and a, a vine grows up and shades him from the sun, and then the vine dies, and uh, Jonah's furious with this. And God says to him, Jonah, do you do right to be angry? And Jonah says, yes, I'm angry enough to die, like a four-year-old would. And it's right there in the Bible. But you know... That's what he, I think it's what he needed to do to get past that stage. I don't think it would have helped Jonah if he'd said, no, Lord, I am not angry. You give, you take away. That's, he wasn't in that place. You know, that's the place you need to get to. But you, it's no use just pretending you're in that place. It's no good just producing the correct Christian response. Now, the flip side of this is the stage of bargaining, where something bad happens and you can find yourself in a position where you sort of pray things like, oh God, if you'll just deal with this for me, then I promise I'll do that in response. Again, I wonder if that's something that's more common in people who've grown up as Christians, and you, which it shouldn't be, but I think you can end up where you feel like you can make a deal with God. And the response for that is to acknowledge God's sovereignty. To realize that we are in no position to bargain with him. And he doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need us to come up with a better compromise than he's thought of. It's good for our hearts. It's good for our souls to recognize that God is God. And then the fourth stage in this model, uh, it's, it's called depression in the, the way it was originally formulated. But it's not talking about clinical depression. It's not talking about the illness. It just means being very sad. And this as well is something I think that sometimes we've just got to go through and that trying to short-circuit it doesn't really help us. It's the same with the anger, I guess. The same is true with sadness as well. And we can be in a position, I think, where, again, the correct Christian response we know is, no, the joy of the Lord sustains me. But actually, if I'm still sad, that's not helping me. It's not helping anyone. So there's a lot we need to go through. It does take time. And the only thing to say about that, really, is that just repeatedly coming back to Jesus is what is going to get us through, week by week, day by day. There are no shortcuts. You can't... Is it go ahead to Marylebone Station, is it, when you pick up the right community chest? We can't do that. Right, if you do that, you don't pick up your $200. Right. We've just got to go through. We can't go around. Can't go over it. Can't go under it. <laughs> got to go through it. That's the reality. Yeah. So all these responses take time. Uh, and in a moment, Fiona will join me. We're going to briefly pray for you. But the Bible verse I want to leave you with is this. Uh, from the book of Habakkuk, a prophet during a terrible, terrible time when Israel was being invaded by the most uh, appalling invaders, the Babylonians, the most uncivilized and vicious, and longing for deliverance. And what he ended up saying is this, Habakkuk 2, verse 3. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place 
It will not be delayed. God has his timing. He has his plan. It will come. He will do what he intends to do. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently. It will surely take place and will not be delayed. Will you join me? So, Father, we want to come before you in honesty. We want to recognize the things that we've lost in the last 18 months. In some cases, friends or family. Closeness to people we haven't seen. Seeing each other's children growing up. Uh, a year of education. Jobs in some cases. Uh, distance from our peer groups, from our friends. Lord, we have lost so much. And we come to you honestly bringing the sorrow that we feel about that and the sadness that it's left and acknowledging the way that we've been chipped away at and that we're in some sense lesser people than we were before this. And we want to come to you seeing you, trusting you, loving you and seeking the healing that only you can bring. Holy Spirit, would you come please? Holy Spirit, God with us in this place, in this time. Will you begin in each of us, please, the work that we so desperately need doing as we start to recover? In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, thank you. When we look at you, we don't see a harsh, angry God. We see a gentle and humble heart reaching out, beckoning us, inviting us, encouraging us, strengthening us, healing and restoring us, giving us hope and giving us the rest that we need. Father, we come to you now. We want to drink deeply in, into that um, the wells of, of healing that you're offering this morning. Holy Spirit, will you come and do that work in the individual lives of everyone who, who's senses that you're touching them in this morning and as a church and as a community and as a nation come and heal in jesus name amen